Well, you and I have considered power and its many abuses. We've looked into what deceit can do and how it so easily happens in us in individuals and in our systems. We have considered systemic abuse and how God's so-called institutions can actually be full of deceit and abuse while using God's name to cover up what God hates. And now we're going to consider redemptive power as it is seen in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. However, I'm gonna take a little bit of a detour first and I want to look at an example, which we've already referred to, that Jesus used regarding leaders and their followers so we can be really true in our way of looking at these things, number one and two, what it really means to follow him. A church that follows her head, the good and great shepherd, is a refuge for the flock. It is green pastures and clear waters. It is a place of restoration for wounded sheep and most certainly a place free of wolves. Both the secular and religious news have globally exposed the fact, as we all know, that not only are there wolves in the fold, Again, we have in the name of our God protected their place among God's sheep by complicity, by cover up and by deceit. We have protected the institution of shepherding rather than the sheep. So let us consider a little bit more specifically the characteristics of wolves and sheep to help us understand what, why Jesus illustrated things in that way. Wolves can run close to 40 miles an hour. They are physically powerful and their rates for successful hunting go up when they hunt alone. Wolves are consistently, relentlessly in search of prey. They never stop. They have insight, they have foresight, and they have the ability to plan accordingly. In some ways, that sounds like pretty good qualities for a leader, doesn't it? A wolf must perennially solve two problems, finding prey and confronting their prey. The presence of human beings stresses them, agitates them. That means that the presence of human beings is protection for the sheep. Sheep, on the other hand, can only run up to 25 miles an hour. They are flock animals, not predators. Sheep are naturally inclined to follow a leader to new pastures, which makes them vulnerable. They are not particularly discerning creatures, as they will usually follow the first individual to move. They are a prey species, which means that they are vulnerable and they need constant protection. If they are targeted by a wolf and stand their ground, the wolf is likely to ignore them. The wolf will try to intimidate them into running, so they are separated. Sheep react in ways that increase their vulnerability. Everything a wolf does is purposed to isolate and exploit the vulnerable. So wolves are more powerful, sheep are more vulnerable. The hungrier a wolf is, the more dangerous he or she is. Wolves who are hungry isolate themselves because their chance of feeding is much higher. A wolf in sheep's clothing as you can see, would be extremely dangerous. Sheep are very vulnerable and usually respond to wolves in ways that actually increase their vulnerability, hence the need for a refuge. Sheep 
need a good shepherd. All sheep require a shepherd if they are to survive and flourish. And we said earlier already that the word pastor comes from the Latin word for shepherd, meaning to lead or to pasture or to guard and protect. So a shepherd then is clearly not like a wolf. Everything a wolf does is purposed to isolate, separate, and exploit. Everything the shepherd does is purposed to protect, nurture, and guide all of those under his or her care. From this, I think, there are two foundational truths that we need to be aware of regarding ourselves. The first is that there is only one true, good, and great shepherd. And you and I are not he. No matter our course of study, no matter our position, no matter our degrees, no matter anything, we are not the good and great shepherd. We are, in fact, all sheep. No position, no training, no intelligence, no fame, no wealth or adoration of others ever changes that fact. Jesus alone is the good and great shepherd, and all of us are his sheep and desperately need his protection. The main job requirement of all sheep is to follow the shepherd. That about sums it up. That is to be the driving force of our lives, no matter what. That means love and obedience to Jesus Christ is how we follow our shepherd. Following has nothing to do with the trappings of our lives, our status, our fame, our power, or our work. Following Jesus is our primary calling, no matter the externals. That means no one listening to me is really a shepherd. We are all sheep. The highest you can ever be is an under shepherd, which is a high and holy calling for sure, but it is also a lowly one. We tend the flock, not lording it over them, but as examples who faithfully follow the good shepherd. We are low ranking. We model love and obedience to Jesus Christ for the sake of the other sheep who we want to copy love and obedience to Jesus Christ. We work ever and always under God's authority. We do not take his place. We do not have his power. His instruction to us is feed my sheep, not yours. Feed my lambs. We are first to be obedient to him personally and second obedient to his shepherding instructions for his sheep. That means as under shepherds, we lead with his character made real in our flesh. With a comprehensive godliness that carries his fragrance. Jesus, the shepherd, anointed with the spirit and all power, went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed. The Hebrew word for oppression means injury, cutting into pieces with deceit or fraud. That is a wolf in sheep's clothing. It is not an under shepherd. The second foundational truth is that until our good shepherd returns, there will be wolves. We vulnerable humans actually want that not to be true. We try to convince ourselves sometimes that they're not around because we feel safer if we think they're not. We understandably long for a safe place, 
a home where we can lay aside our vigilance, our fear, and our uncertainty. We have all of that in the person of Jesus Christ, not in a place here on earth, even a church. We all have it in him. It does not exist unblemished anywhere else in this world. In the best and safest of marriages, we still get injured. In the best and safest of churches, we are still vulnerable to an expertly, expertly deceitful wolf finding a way in. We are uncomfortable with the awareness of our vulnerability, and some of us respond by becoming hypervigilant and constantly afraid, and others of us try to look at anything that threatens what we long for and deny the signs. Jesus said, beware of the false prophets, and we said earlier that that meant false truth tellers who come in in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They look like the sheep category, and we let out a sigh of relief, but they behave like the wolf category, and we often initially deny that because we don't want them to be a wolf. Jesus is not warning us against someone who does not teach the truth just like we like. He's warning us against the teachers the spokespersons who speak orthodoxy, but whose life is false. One who talks like a sheep, but is a wolf. The words may be accurate or orthodox, that's the sheep's clothing, but the heart of the person is wolfish, looking to exploit whoever is vulnerable by way of deception. They attempt to look like sheep, but inwardly where you cannot see, they are robbers, grasping and predatory. The purpose of the sheep's clothing is to hide their true nature. They attempt to look like sheep and behave like sheep in order to appear as something they are not. And the reason for that is because they are hungry for sheep. True sheep do not eat each other. Wolves eat sheep. And they are looking for isolated, needy, frightened sheep. They look for someone who's not likely to speak up. They look for someone who's easily overpowered. A vulnerable woman in a damaging marriage or a history of abuse. A child or teen on the fringe of the youth group. They are not noticed. They are not well connected. They are often not considered important. And they are hungry little sheep. Attention and inclusion draw them in, and they are easily seduced by a niceness that is, in fact, predatory and deceptive, but they cannot see. It's a staggering, staggering contrast to our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is the character to be seen and known in human form? What does it mean to love and obey Jesus, no matter the cost? From the very beginning, our God has been building his kingdom with human beings, imagine that, who were created in his image and were to bring his likeness to bear on each other and on his world. As a result of our choice of self-rule, we instead live on a ruined planet and by way of deceit, we are creating greater ruin to ourselves and to others. In response, our Lord came in the flesh to rescue us from ourselves, and he has called us now again to be like him in this place. God is light. There is no darkness in him. Light searches. Light uncovers and exposes. Light brings health. Christ exposes us to ourselves he shines his light on the rot in our souls and lives, and yet he somehow remains uncorrupted. When he was here in the flesh, he exposed Rome. When he was here, he exposed the religious system operating under his name. In Jesus was life, and that life 
was the light of all mankind. You and I say marriage is sacred, and yet Christians, statistically, divorce and batter as regularly as the world. There's no difference in the statistics. We say sex is sacred, and yet we consume pornography. We see glimpses of darkness in high places, and we protect their positions. Why? Because of the gifts, the fame, or their brilliance. We follow blind guides into a pit, all in the precious name of Jesus. He is light. Light exposes. Why does he do that? Because he loves you. He loves the abuser, and he loves the victim. The abuser is imprisoned in darkness and barreling towards soul death. The victims are ignored and swept away. Jesus said, feed my sheep. You will feed them poison, and you will poison yourself unless you feed from roots that go down deep into him. You know, even when he was talking to Peter, he says to Peter, do you love me? He asked it again. You think about that question. I mean, exploitation is absolutely out of the, out of the question with that question. There's no room for feeding on sheep. Loving him makes that go away. It is not about building kingdoms. It is not about getting fame. It is not about honor, and it is not about the externals, like numbers and degrees and all those things we count. It is ever and only about likeness to Jesus Christ in the flesh in your life. People often ask, well, how do we recognize wolves in our midst? The essence to the answer is you can tell wolves if you aren't one. That's your, ba your greatest protection against wolves is that you are not a wolf. If you ex start excusing yourself, ignoring your impact on others when you hurt them, you are complicit in things in those instances that are not godly. You are complicit in things that further a kingdom goal but look nothing like Jesus Christ. Deceiving yourself regarding your actions and your words at home or with those under you. And as you practice those things, you become blind to what is in front of you as well. You cannot deceive yourself and see clearly outside of yourself. That's not possible. Several years ago, I met with a group of elders to talk about domestic abuse. So they brought me several ca uh, cases in the church they didn't know what to do with. And I, I realized in listening to them that the cases that they had the most difficulty with were those where there were no visible bruises. I mean, how can we tell? <laughs> we discussed a marriage of many years and the brutal, constant verbal and emotional trashing by this husband of his wife and all of his children. They lived in fear. Everybody agreed. They were shrunken, tormented. They were squashed by this man. At one point, an elder said he found the case very difficult, and he was clearly talking in a way that was excusing the man for the way he was abusing his family. He had several ways of reframing and excusing him. I pushed back a little bit, and his response was this. I do not see what he is, how what he is doing is any different from what I am doing. I scream at my children every day. Now, his screaming at his children and this man's screaming at his wife and children were in a different category in the sense of intensity and words and everything else. But it was on the same continuum of unlikeness to Jesus Christ. They were both there. His excuses and his self-deception regarding his own behavior led to his blindness and dismissal of what was in fact horrific and wolf-like. 
I said to him, gently, that his excusing of his own behavior led him to excuse what was truly awful. And the need for both men was to repent and truly change because both men were grieving the heart of our God and the best gift that man could give God, his family, the church, and this violent man was to lead the way and face himself in truth and let God mold him into a different man and father. You will not see wolves clearly until you tend to your own wolfish tendencies before God. You will excuse them because you excuse yourself. The other way we fail to recognize wolves is to measure a person by their gifting and their results, not by their character. A powerful speaker who teaches doctrine we agree with and whose results we enjoy in the church can be a wolf. We don't even like to think of that possibility. He could be immoral, a bully, an egocentric person in power. We excuse these things like the elder, either because we struggle with some of them ourselves, or we say things like, well, he's overworked, he's tired, he's stressed, and he didn't mean it. And because the results of that ministry, so-called, feed us in some way, we cover it up. A shepherd does not do those things. A shepherd ever and always looks like Jesus Christ. Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I love that phrase. Knowing the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and he was going back to God and he got up and what did he do? He lay aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Now, to gird yourself is to prepare for something difficult and challenging. It means getting things out of the way that would trip you up. It's something soldiers do. Jesus, knowing he had all power, took a towel. That's a remarkable statement. It is servant's work. It is not glitzy work. It's dirty work. It's little and it's lowly. And he's washing feet that are going to just get dirty again. It's not like it's going to last. But what he was doing is teaching his flocks how to shepherd. Teaching them and teaching us. There was a wolf in the room that day. And do note that that wolf was indistinguishable to the rest of the disciples. They all said, is it me? They didn't all point at Judas. Those who lived with Judas and walked with him and served with him did not know who he really was. We are told he was a thief. That used to bother me for years because Jesus gave him the money bag. I mean, why would you give a money bag to a thief? That doesn't make any sense to me. So why, why would he do that? Well, it took me a few years to actually figure something out. But it was an invitation to the light. He gave him what would expose him. And in the exposure was inviting Judas to himself. I suspect some of you in ministry have been given money bags by God. And the reason they've been given to you is to turn the light on something that you don't want to look at. It's a loving gesture. He says, look. Look at who you are, see who you are, and run to me. Judas did not. He chose to feed himself off others, and no one but Jesus saw and understood the danger in the man. If you are holding ministry in your hands, in your life, you've been given the bag. It will expose you. Others may not see but our Lord does. You may be indistinguishable to everyone else, but you are not indistinguishable to him. He is light. He is truth. 
it is wise not to fool ourselves. Though others may not see, our God does. That means some of you in here are wolfish. You have exploited, used, fed off, and covered up your own behavior and the behavior of other wolves. Some of you are sheep who have been damaged by wolves. There is a good shepherd who is always good and a refuge who hates what has been done to you in his name. Some of you are both. You are wolves because when you were a lamb, you were used and exploited. I want to close with two different poems. In case you can't tell, I like poetry. This first one is written by Amy Carmichael, who was in India for many, many years, uh, rescuing children from Hindu temples where they were essentially trafficked before trafficked was a word, and who fell and ended up in bed flat on her back for years, and is when during those years when she wrote most of what she wrote. But in listening to this poem, I would like you to think back to the story I told you about the Cape Coast castle in Ghana and contrast it with this. And some of you I know, because I know statistics in this room, are victims, maybe from many years ago, maybe not so long ago. Some of you have your own history of being victimized. And so I would like you to listen to this in that way as well. She's calling us to Calvary, the killing tree, to elucidate our lives. And the killing tree is in Cambodia. I have stood there. And it is where, during Pol Pot's regime, they took children and babies and beat them against the tree in order to kill them so that they would not live and fight against the government. So she's calling Calvary a killing tree, obviously, in a very different way. She says this, yet listen now, oh, listen with the wandering olive trees and the white moon that looked between the leaves and the gentle earth that shuddered as she felt great drops of blood all torturing questions cease in him who girds his soul to listen there. There, only there, can we take heart to hope for all lost lambs, I even for ravening wolves. There are things done in the world today would root up faith, but for Gethsemane. For Calvary, interprets human life. No path of pain, but there we meet our Lord and all the strain, the terror, and the strife die down like waves before his peaceful word. And nowhere but beside that awful cross and where the olives grow along the hill can we accept the unexplained, the loss, the crushing agony, and hold us still. And nowhere is that clearer vision given, which pierces a bewildering providence and opens windows upon highest heaven. But there we see suffering omnipotence. It's a remarkable pairing of words, suffering omnipotence. The second one, is called The Bag. And it was written by George Herbert in 1633. And I want you to hear this, having spoken about Judas having the bag, and hear about a different bag that is present for all of us. Away despair, my gracious Lord doth hear, the winds and waves assail, assault my keel. He doth preserve it, he doth steer. Even when the boat seems most to reel, storms are the triumphs of his art. Art, well may he close his eyes 
but never his heart. Hast thou not heard that my Lord Jesus died? Then let me tell thee a strange story. The God of power, as he did ride in his majestic robes of glory, resolved to light. And so one day he did descend, undressing all the way. The stars his tire of light and rings obtained, the cloud his bow, the fire his spear, the sun his azure mantle gained. And when they asked what he would wear, he smiled and said as he did go, he had new clothes awaking here below. When he was come, as travelers are wont, he did repair unto an inn. Both then and after many a brunt he did endure to cancel sin. And having given the rest before, here he gave up his life to pay our score. But as he was returning, there came one that ran upon him with a spear. He who came hither all alone, bringing nor man, nor arms, nor fear, received the blow upon his side, and straight he turned and to his brethren cried, If you have anything to send or write, I have no bag. But here is room. Unto my father's hands and sight, believe me, it shall safely come, that I shall mind what, I, what you impart. Look, you may put it very near my heart. Or if hereafter any of my friends will use me in this kind, the door shall still be open. He spoke, speaking to us. And what he sends I will present, and somewhat more, not to his hurt. Sighs will convey anything to me. Hark, despair away. <laughs> 